Egypt. But it's still called Vayechi. He lived. It's because of the legacy that these great people left behind them. Sure enough, it is inevitable that we will physically expire, but in a spiritual way, we continue to live on. And if you have a look at the primary theme of this week's parasha, you will see that it is brachot, blessings. Jacob summons his two grandchildren, Ephraim and Menashe, born to Joseph and Osnat in Egypt, and he blesses them. And then immediately prior to his death, his children gather around him, and he gives an individual blessing to each and every one of them. So therefore, my theme this evening will be blessings. And let's start off with a question. It is in this parasha that Jacob instructs us for all time to bless our sons to be ke-Ephraim v'chim like Ephraim and Menashe. So the obvious question is, while our daughters are blessed to be like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, if we're not going to bless our sons to be like Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, why do we choose Ephraim and Menashe, two seemingly insignificant biblical characters? Could we not think of greater role models for our children to follow? So in order that we can understand some answers to this question, let's look at the context within which the blessing was given by Jacob to his grandchildren and through them to Jewish people throughout all ages. Jacob was blind. He knew that he would not live for much longer. He asked Joseph to bring the grandchildren to him. And Joseph was very careful to place Menashe, the firstborn, in front of Jacob to this side, so that Jacob would be able to place his right hand on Menashe's head, and Ephraim to that side so that he would place his left hand on Ephraim's head. <coughs> Jacob, who was blind, sensed where the boys were, and he crisscrossed his hands. Now his right hand, a symbol of greater strength, was on Ephraim's head, and his left hand on his head. Joseph goes out. And he says, Lochei no father, this is wrong. Ki simi mincha rosho, Menashe is the firstborn. It's on his head that you must place your right hand. Joseph is panicking. His father is getting it wrong. And Jacob answers and he says, Yadati bini yadati, I know my son what I'm doing. And he proceeds to bless the children in this way. Now, how could Jacob have done that? If I was to write a book on how to be a good par grandparent, I think the book would probably be one page long, and there would be one very simple message, and that is, don't mix. <laughs> You've had your turn to have direct impact, to influence, to guide, to inspire. Now leave it up to your children to raise their children in the way that they wish. Kleib Nachas, Look after the grandkids, smile, enjoy the photographs, and let your children learn the hard way when it comes to raising their children. And if at any time they ask you for advice and they consult with you, say, thank God that we're being included, and then offer the advice that you've been asked for. But look at what Jacob is doing here. When he was young, he usurped the birthright from his older brother Esau with disastrous consequences. One generation later, Jacob again favors Joseph, the younger child, as opposed to the other children. And again, having given him a coat of stripes, catastrophic results. One generation later, Jacob comes into Joseph's home, and Joseph is so anxious. He doesn't want what went wrong in his childhood and his parents' childhood and the grandparents to happen in his own home. So he sized, puts the boys in the appropriate position. Jacob is insistent on going the other way, and Joseph says, Father, please, don't. And Jacob ignores him. And he proceeds and he goes ahead with his right hand on the younger boy, favoring the younger over the older. 
how can we justify this action of Jacob? And I think that we need to look at it in the overall context of the book of Genesis. If we were to give a, tight, a subtitle to the book of Genesis, which we're completing this week, I think a good subtitle will be the book of the dysfunctional family. <laughs> if you have a look at just about every single family in Sefer Breshid, I think to be dysfunctional was the norm. That was normal. Had there been a regular family, they would have been considered to be abnormal, starting with the very first family on earth. Have you ever thought of it? There were just four people, Adam and Eve and their children, Cain and Abel. The first naturally born person in this world became a murderer. The first experience of parenting was a failure. They couldn't blame the neighbors. They couldn't blame the in-laws. They couldn't blame the grandparents. They couldn't blame television or the internet. Something disastrously wrong happened within that family structure. And you know, there's a hint of it. It's the name Cain, Cain. When he was born, and you'll recall, of course, that God created Adam, and then from Adam God created Eve. Therefore, Adam and Eve were created directly by the Almighty. So Cain was the first naturally born child. What did Eve declare? Kaniti ish et Hashem. I have acquired a person together with God. Kaniti, I've acquired him. He belongs to me. That's where Cain, Cain comes from, meaning he's my possession. He belongs to me. And you can understand what was going on in the mind of Eve at the time. She and Adam had been directly created by God, and therefore they belonged to God, so to speak. Now, she, like God, had produced a person into this world, and she said, I'm like the Almighty, I'm like God, and I've produced this child. He therefore belongs to me. And she made a critical error, because when it comes to raising our children, we bring them into this world, we feed them, we nourish them, we inspire them, we guide them, we give them aspirations, but we don't possess them. We have to respect their individuality and the unique nature of every single personality within our families. But in that home, Eve believed that Cain belonged to her. And so he grew up having numerous hang-ups and having significant complexes to the extent that he was this mummy's boy and she was overbearing. I'm just presuming all this <laughs> based on the name she gave him. <laughs> but certainly, he was a person who couldn't face failure. He couldn't deal with disappointment. And therefore, when his brother's sacrifice was favored over his, he just lost it. And the result is that he killed his brother Abel. That's how the first family on earth started. And then you go, I'm not going to go through every single family, but uh, just highlights in the home of Abraham and Sarah, you've got the half-brothers Isaac and Ishmael who can't get on well with each other to the extent that Ishmael's influence over Isaac and the tension between them is so deep that Hagar and Ishmael are banished from the home. Separation is the only way forward. And then one generation later, the twin brothers Esau and Jacob and Jacob has to flee for his life again, separation. His brother wants to kill him. And one generation later, now it's Joseph and the brothers with their attempted fratricide, and Joseph is sold into Egypt. And in this context, Jacob arrives in Egypt. He's reunited with Joseph after 22 years. He's introduced to Joseph's wife, Osnat, and to their children, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Jacob sees something absolutely remarkable. The boys get on well together. Joseph has actually been able to correct what he had grown up within, to find the antidote to the dysfunctionality of all families beforehand. So Jacob therefore contrives a situation during the blessing to ensure that for all time we will remember what Menashe said when Ephraim was favored over him. You will recall that at the time when Jacob was preferred over Esau, Esau cried out a loud and bitter cry. What did Menashe say? Nothing. And that was what Jacob 
wants us to recall. It's the reaction of Manasseh. He didn't respond. So, Ephraim, right and left hand, who cares about right hands and left hands? Get on well together, that's what counts. In our family, we don't have a number one and a number two. Our parents love us all, we're equals. That's the point that Jacob wanted to show for all time. And Jacob wants us to bless our children that they should be Ephraim v'chim so that within our families there won't be sibling rivalry that will eat away at domestic harmony, that there should be shlom by it, family harmony and unity and peace within our homes, and that it should extend to our communities and to our people as a whole. It's difficult enough dealing with external threats to Am Yisrael within our own ranks. We need to have shlom bayit, peace and unity, and that is the blessing that we give to our sons, that they should be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Now let me share with you a second very different reason. The success of Joseph and Osnat in Egypt to raise two children to be loyal to the faith of father and grandparents, that was absolutely remarkable, stunningly remarkable. After all, Ephraim and Manasseh didn't even know the home that the father had come from and the mother had converted to this faith. The one single only Hebrew family in an entire land, and the parents succeeded in raising the boys to be loyal to their faith. And this is the bracha that Jacob realizes that Jewish parents through future generations will want to give to their children. It would be nice to have an Abraham, incredible to have an Isaac, wonderful to have a Jacob. But all we want is to see our kids under a chuppah, to see the continuity of Yiddishkeit through the generations. We want our children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh, engaging with the world around them, part of civilization, enjoying the experiences within their environment, and being true to their traditions and loving their faith. That's the bracha that we give to our children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh. And one final commentary. This is the commentary of the Chofetz Chaim, based on a midrash which tells us, Menashe, like his father, was a politician. Menashe had diplomatic skills from Joseph. And Menashe was active in the court of Pharaoh and assisted his father Joseph in ruling the Egyptian people. Ephraim was a Talmud Chacham. He studied Torah. He devoted his life to Torah values and to Torah knowledge. What Jacob realized was that the right model for Jewish existence is not to be exclusively and only engaged in the world around us or exclusively and only in Torah. You need to blend the two together, a fusion of both, what we call Torah and Derech Eretz. And therefore, he didn't want Jewish children subsequently to be just like Ephraim or just like Menashe. The bracha we give our children is, may you be Ephraim v'chi Menashe, like both of them, fused into one. Study Torah. Be knowledgeable about your faith. And at the same time, bring the beauty of your Torah tradition to impact positively on your environment. Be like Ephraim and Menashe, rolled into one. Let's now go to the actual wording of the blessing that Jacob gave to his grandchildren. The wording has become popularized there are a number of melodies, you might be familiar with them. And this is how Jacob blessed his grandchildren and through them, Jewish people in subsequent generations. Hamalach ha-go'el May the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Yevarechet anearim. May he bless these lads. V'yikarei v'hem shmi v'shem avotai Avraham v'yitzchak. And may they be called after my name and the names of my fathers, Abram and Isaac. And may they multiply like fish in the midst of the land. And the most intriguing term of all here is May they multiply like fish. It's a verb that doesn't appear anywhere else in the whole Bible. If we were to literally translate it into English, it would be may they fishify themselves. 
It's created only for this context. So what did Jacob mean when he said, for Yidgu Larov? May subsequent Jewish generations multiply like fish. He was telling us, if we're going to succeed against the odds in maintaining our Yiddishkeit and preserving our Jewish identity, we have to be like fish. So I'm now going to present to you five different perushim. Five commentaries. I'm going to leave my favorite one for last. You know there's a principle in the study of Rashi. Whenever Rashi gives more than one commentary, more than one explanation, he leaves his favorite one for last. And in studying Rashi, you must always ask the question, what did he see wrong in commentary number one or commentary number two that he had to come up with a second or a third one? You won't find in anything I'm going to say anything that I see wrong in the first four, but please wait for number five. It's my favorite. So, perish number one. We always go to Rashi. How does Rashi explain the Yid Gularov? And usually, Rashi says as follows. From the world of superstition, he says, fish are shielded from eye in horror, from the evil eye, because they're under the surface of water. And God wants fish to be protected, because human beings continuously through the ages want to catch fish in order to eat fish. Therefore, fish are an endangered species of life. Consequently, God protects fish. They have the blessing of the Almighty. And as a result, Jacob here realized that similarly the Jewish people would always need help from heaven in order to survive. We can engage in all types of strategies. We can have a vision for the future. We can undertake all types of activities, but ultimately, to guarantee Jewish survival, we need great strategies together with help from heaven. Do you know when the very first time was when the term blessing was ever mentioned, as recorded in the Bible? It's on the fifth day of creation, when fish were created. And there we read, And God blessed the fish and he said to them, May you be fruitful and multiply. So the very first bracha on record was a bracha to fish. And the Talmud explains, the fish need it because of us, <laughs> because we're constantly at them, <laughs> because uh, we're emptying out their stocks, because we want to eat them. Now there's a great question that you can actually ask. This blessing for the fish, on day five of creation. Man wasn't yet created. Man was created on day six of creation. That's when Adam was born. Not born, he was created by God. So surely God should have given this bracha to the fish after human beings were in the world. Why did he give the bracha at a time when there wasn't any danger? And there can only be one answer. The Talmud says, Lahakdim trufa lamaka to provide an antidote before the danger set, to engage in preventative measures, to ensure that they'll never become a problem in the first place. That's why the bracha was given for the fish before human beings came around. Not when we had already had eaten up most of the stocks, and then at, at a late stage, God would come and say, okay, I give you a blessing that against the odds you should survive. And this is such an important message for us. Because when it comes to that which is most important in our lives, we shouldn't wait for the tsaris to set in, for the crisis to arrive. Ezehu chacham haro'et anolad. In the ethics of the fathers, we are told, who is wise? It's the person who sees the morrow. Let's try and guess what our challenges, what our crises of the future will be, and let's plan now to prevent problems from arising. And that's exactly what we find in our Torah reading of this week. The family of Jacob are going down to Egypt, 70 souls in all. And Jacob decides to send Yehuda. Judah is sent to Joseph, Lohorot Lefanav Goshna, to show the way to the family to reach Goshen. A vanguard. Judah goes ahead to show them the way. But hold on a second, Judah's never been in Goshen. <laughs> this is an area of Egypt that's been set aside for the people. So how can somebody who's not familiar with the way show the way to the others? But you see, the term that's used here is lehorot, from moreh, hora'ah, 
Torah, it means to educate, to show the way through chinuch, through tuition. What Jacob was doing was, he realized that he couldn't arrive with his family, allow them all to settle down, to get used to a new and fresh environment, away from the holiness of the land of Canaan. And then suddenly, for all types of pressures to exist, challenges to arrive, and then to say, ah, we need to start teaching them something. Instead, he sent Judah ahead to establish schools before the arrival of the family. So, around running, that they would arrive, and on day one, the children would be taught. And the adults would also engage in education, because education is for people of all levels. And that's an example of how we give the bracha before the crisis arises. And that has always been our traditional response, to see ahead and to guarantee that we have the finest possible Jewish education to ensure that we as a people will have a future. And that's an idea that we learn from the blessing that God gave to fish. So therefore, in our first response to Vayid Gularov, may you multiply like fish, we're saying, God, we're in your hands. Please save us. Parish number two. The second. This is a Midrash. And the Midrash tells us that there is a difference between the kosher signs of animals on one hand and fish on the other. They both have two signs. Animals have a sign that is hidden, they chew the cud, and a sign that is exposed, split hooves. Fish have two signs, and they are both exposed. They're both external, fins and scales. And therefore, the Midrash says that a fish wears its identity. And a kosher fish, therefore, will always remain kosher, regardless of how it dies and how it is prepared. You know, with regard to animals, you can have a kosher animal like a cow, but if you don't shecht it in an appropriate way, or if after the shechita you inspect its lungs and they're punctured, it's not kosher. But with regard to a kosher fish, you can catch it in a net, you can catch it on a hook and line, it can just be lying there on the beach. You can go into a supermarket and choose it from a tank as you do in Israel. This is the one I want, and they'll hit it over the head and give it to you. It makes no difference how it dies. Once it's kosher, it's always kosher. By the way, in the event that you, prefer, you prepare the fish in a treif kitchen, it will become treif. Please don't misquote me here. But the idea is that the identity of the fish always remains the same. And the message says the Midrash is, Yehudi shechata Yehudi hu, Yisrael shechata Yisrael hu. A Jewish person who has erred is still Jewish. All Jewish people are precious in our eyes, and it's not for us to judge others. We leave judgment in the hands of God. Because the person that we might be seeking to judge could indeed be far more righteous than you and I are. Because how are we to know about the circumstances, the background of that person's life? And as a result, says the Midrash, Jacob was here sending a message to Jewish people through all generations. If you're going to survive, Havat Yisrael, wholesome, total, unquestioning love towards your fellow Jews. Ensure that you are there for one and all. Don't be there just for yourselves. Reach out to others and help them to attain their goals and to achieve their dreams. Which brings me back to Joseph, so central to our Torah reading at this time. Dreams were an essential part of his life. You will recall how Joseph dreamt two dreams, and both of them suggested that he was going to be lord and master over the rest of his family. And after he revealed those dreams to his family, things went from bad to worse. They first wanted to kill him, then they sold him into slavery, and then he went down to Egypt, sold to Potiphar, the event with Potiphar's wife, thrown into a dungeon, correctly interpreting dreams, then being totally forgotten about. Joseph reached the lowest possible ebb. And then there were two other dreams. Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker. They told their dreams to Joseph. He correctly interpreted them. And suddenly he found himself being catapulted up into Pharaoh to be second only to Pharaoh himself. How can you explain that all? 
what's the difference between the first dreams and the latter dreams? And there can only be one explanation. The first dreams were about Joseph himself, his own personal aspirations, his personal goals. The second set of dreams were the dreams of others, and he was helping them to achieve their goals. When you dream only about yourself, then you're on the way down. When you exist in this world, other people achieve their dreams, then you're on the way up. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph. To the extent that when he to help other people achieve their dreams, he was then helping Pharaoh to interpret his dreams, and Joseph was able to save all of mankind in his time during a time of worldwide famine. And that's how we need to be. We need to be here not just for ourselves, but to reach out to others. You know, in our benching, there is a statement that we make in the last paragraph, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen a righteous person who is old and who has never had to beg for food. Hold on a second, that's not true. There are many righteous people who need to beg for food. So, you know, in, in some of the texts, in old-style sidurim and benches, they would put this in small characters, and they would instruct you to say it in, in an un- There's somebody around the table who's relying on charity, and then you'd be embarrassing that person because you know, obviously the person can't be righteous if they have to beg for charity, but th- this doesn't make sense, any of it. There can only be one commentary, and it is as follows. I've been young now, I'm old. And I haven't seen, meaning I haven't just stood to watch. When I've come across people who are in a state of distress, who are suffering, who are begging for food, I haven't just stood to watch, I've got up and I've done something about it. Because that is the traditional Jewish way of responding to the plight of other people. And that applies to how we engage with our fellow Jews and through Tikkun Olam with everybody in the world at large. And it's only when we reach out to others with love and affection in this way that we are able to maintain our precious Jewish values and guarantee the continuity of our faith. Commentary. Number three. So here, Jacob wanted to reveal to his grandchildren and through them to us a lesson about Jewish pride. You see, it goes back to that same Midrash with regard to the signs of Kashrut, the way in which the fish wears its status on the outside indicates that the fish is saying to the world, I'm kosher and I'm proud of it. Not like animals which hide an element of their kashrut, which cover up any part of their identity. The fish is there to express and to explain to the world, this is what I am about. Therefore, says this Midrash, it is important that if we're to maintain our Jewish identity, our connection, With our roots, we have to have Jewish pride. And if there is one archetypal, biblical character of Jewish pride, it is the prophet Jonah. Caught there, out in a boat, in the midst of the seas, having been sent to Nineveh on a divine mission. Instead, he flees, and he's on this boat on its way to Tarshish. God sends a storm. The sailors realize that their lives are in jeopardy. They cast lots. They fall on Jonah. And they realize it's the stranger who is putting their lives in peril. Who is he? What is he all about? And before they pass judgment on him, because they're just about to toss him into the waters of the sea, the captain comes over to Jonah and he puts four questions to him. Where are you coming from? Where are you going to? What nation are you part of and what do you do? And Jonah answers with two words, Ivri Anochi, I'm a Hebrew. I'm Jewish, and I'm proud of it. If you want to know the essence of my character, 
what my personality is made up of, where I'm coming from, where I'm going to, what nation I'm part of, and what I do, it can all be encapsulated in these two words, every anochi, and it makes no difference to me what you're going to do as a result, because that's what I am about. I'm Jewish, and I'm proud of it. The Gemara, in Masechet Sukkah, Daf Lamed Hay, page 35 of Tractate Sukkah, reveals to us an ancient practice in the city of Jerusalem. Up to this day, Jerusalem has added stringencies which don't apply to other cities, such as the time that Shabbat comes in and various other laws and customs. And the Talmud tells us that during the festival of Sukkot in ancient times, the custom in Jerusalem was that whenever a person walked out of his house, lulavo biyado, he carried the lulav in his hand. We're not sure if it's all the four kinds, or just the palm branch, the lulav. Lulav of the other. Probably it's just the lulav, the palm branch. Go to a shop, visit friends, go to the hall of study. Lulav of the He would have his lulav in his hands throughout the festival. That was the ancient practice in Jerusalem. So we need to ask the following question. Why only the lulav during Sukkot? Why in Jerusalem was there not a custom? during Purim, that a person should carry the Megillah in his hand. During Pesach, a box of matzah. On Rosh Hashanah, a shofar. Why during Sukkot, lulav obiado? And I'd like to suggest as follows. All those other items for the other festivals, you can tuck them into a deep pocket. They can be hidden from the sight of others. A lulav you cannot hide. When you're carrying it, it is seen by one and all. The lulav is a symbol of Jewish pride. And indeed, it's a symbol of the spine through which we stand erect and we declare, this is what we are about. And therefore, it is so important for us to stand up, to be counted, and to let the world know what we are about, to take pride in our Jewish identity. And it's interesting, because the festival of Hanukkah is linked to the festival of Sukkot. It was originally on Sukkot that the first temple was dedicated, and on Hanukkah it was rededicated in second temple times. And also with regard to the view of Shammai, that we go from eight candles down to one, it's in order to remember the fact that the cows brought as sacrifices during the festival of Sukkot went down from 13 on the first day to seven on the last, numbering 70 altogether. And there are many other similarities, but there is one clear similarity, and that is the purpose of the Chanukiah, the menorah during Chanukah, is to send a message to the world. Pishsum Enissa, God performed a miracle for the Jewish people. That's why traditionally we place it at a window or in public places. And so too when it comes to a sukkah, Sukkah is the one mitzvah you cannot perform in secret. You can't have an underground sukkah because the definition of a sukkah is that it has to be open to the elements. So both during Sukkot and on Hanukkah, we are proud of our Judaism. And I think it's so important for our children and grandchildren to get that message. Our Jewish identity is something to be proud of. Our association with the state of Israel is something to be proud of. We have values. We have morals which so many other faiths and systems of life have taken from us and share with us, we can be justifiably proud of our traditions and our way of life. That is the third explanation of what Jacob meant when he said to his grandchildren, Gularov, may you multiply like fish. And now the fourth commentary. It's another midrash. It describes a scene on a rainy day on the waters of a river. And it's possible, says the Midrash, that you're looking out to those waters, and suddenly you see a fish bobbing its head out of water and opening its mouth in order to take in some drops of rain that are coming from the heavens. It's possible that that happens. But isn't it remarkable, says the Midrash? The natural habitat of the fish is water. Wherever it goes, it has an abundant supply of water. And now it's starting to rain. There are fresh drops of water and the fish opens its mouth up to the skies as if it has never seen water in its life before. Says the Midrash. From here we learn 
And this was the message Jacob wanted to convey to us, that we need to be like fish, that we should always be enthusiastic when it comes to the performance of the mitzvot of the Torah. And when it comes to Shabbos, or a particular mitzvah, even though we might have performed it hundreds of times before, we need to open our mouths to take it in as if it's the very first time. And therefore we see that enthusiasm is the antidote to apathy. And within our Jewish world today, I identify apathy as being one of our greatest challenges. It's through apathy that so many people are simply disengaged. They are nominally Jewish, but they're not part of anything at all. There are others who are part of something, but are just carrying out Jewish rules and regulations in a mechanical way without feeling emotional or spiritual about it. That is dangerous to us. We need to bring enthusiasm back right into the heart of our communities and all of our people. You know, the uh, Khatam Sofer said that the the definition of Shomer Shabbat is somebody who looks forward to Shabbos from Sunday to Friday. And somebody who keeps the Shabbos on the Saturday is called an Ose Shabbat. How did he come to this? We all know Shomer Shabbos means you keep Shabbos. Now he's telling us Shomer Shabbos means you look forward to Shabbos from Sunday to Friday. He says he learns it from the verse. And the people of Israel will be Shomer Shabbat. To do Shabbat. To be Ose Shabbat, to do Shabbos means on Shabbos day. Veshamru means you're looking forward to it. And we learn it from the book of Genesis. When Joseph revealed his dreams to his families, his brothers were envious of him. And his father guarded the information. His father waited with keen anticipation to the fulfillment, to the actualization of those dreams. To be shomer means to guard something to the extent that you're waiting for it to happen. And therefore, the Khatam Sofer says that we need to look forward to each Shabbos as if it's going to be the first Shabbos of our lives, and so too to be Shomer Mitzvot. The next time I'm doing whatever it is that is part of the ritual of my faith, I must be so excited that I'm looking forward to it with keen anticipation. And that is why we give names to the days of the week in a way that is different from any other people and in any other language. In all other languages, the days of the week have an identity of their own. In our tradition, it's Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, first day, second day, third day. A day has an identity according to the closeness that it is to the next Shabbat, because we live through the week in anticipation of the Shabbat that is coming our way. So when it comes to education, We need to fire up love and passion and enthusiasm for Jewish people of all ages. You know, the very last mitzvah given in the Torah, God commanded Moses to tell us that we should write a Sefer Torah. And the way that mitzvah number 613 is presented is, and now you must write, Hashira Hazot, this song. The Torah is called a melody, it's a song. So often people think of it as a list of restrictions which make our life tough. Yeah, it's not so easy sometimes, but it's elevating. It's life-shaping, it's life-enhancing. It gives into our lives. It's a melody of life which gives us true simcha. And then Moses goes on to say, Sima Befihem, place Torah in the mouths of the Jewish people. Surely, when dealing with Jewish education, it should be put Torah in the hearts of people, put Torah in the minds of people. Why Sima Befihem, put Torah in the mouths of people? Rabbi Desler, who was a rabbi in Gates, said he went on to live in Israel. Famous Talmudic scholar wrote a book, Michtav Me'eliyahu, and he gives the following commentary. He says that when a parent is feeding an infant some food, what is the aim of the parent? The aim of the parent is to get the food into the mouth. So you'll play a game, and you'll go 
all kinds of directions and helicopter and motor car and this and that. Eventually the kid will open his or her mouth and you put, pop the food in the mouth. Once the food is in the mouth, the parent has done his or her job. What the parent now mustn't do is to try to force the food down the throat of the child. Because if you try to do that, excuse me, the child will reject it. Similarly, we're given a mitzvah to teach Torah through the ages, and we're told, Sima b'fihem, place it in the mouths of Jewish people. Meaning, make Torah knowledge appealing. Make it something that's exciting. Let people know if they're not going for it, they're missing out seriously in their lives. Get them to open their mouths and sim up the and place it in their mouths, but never push it down their throats. Because if you force education upon people, they will in turn reject it. And so often I come across people who in haters of previous generations had some pretty awful experiences, not everybody, but I hear so often stories of the way in which Torah was forced on people, how sometimes parents and educators got it wrong. And today we need to engage with our children, with the next generations, with love, to reach out with compassion, to let them know in an exciting way, this is for you. And the best reason why you should follow the laws of the Torah is not because you'll be punished if you don't, but rather because you'll be missing out seriously, unless you do. We need to bring passion and enthusiasm back into our lives. You know that in the parasha of Kitavo, there is a list called the Tochacha of curses which God forbid can befall our people. And a reason there is given why these curses could take place. It's on account of the fact that you did not serve the Lord your God with joy. Now, that's a strange reason. Because the other Torah is not telling us it's because you didn't serve the Lord your God, but rather you did serve God, but you didn't do it joyously. Therefore, these curses can come about. Isn't that a bit harsh? But surely the explanation must be. We're speaking here about the prospect a continuity of the Jewish people. And in order to guarantee our survival, we need to be joyous about our faith. And if you serve the Lord your God, if you serve the Lord your God without joy, if people are just carrying out mitzvot in a mechanical way, without enthusiasm, without passion, without love, the next generation won't buy it. And God forbid it will all stop there. Therefore, we have to curb apathy. And the best way is to bring enthusiasm back, to be shomrei mitzvot, to have that passion for the joy of Yiddishkeit. And indeed, we will be able to realize that in our 21st century, Jewish law and tradition is more relevant and more life-enhancing than it has ever been before. And I'll give you an example of this. Shabbat UK, which we were able to celebrate in uh, October, was a most remarkable experience. And we estimated that over 100,000 people throughout the UK celebrated Shabbat in a special way over that weekend. And there was one feature of Shabbat UK which I didn't expect to happen. We were investing in our communities, in our congregational life, in hospitality, laws, customs, but then people outside of the Jewish community told us that the whole concept was something which enthralled them. And the national media started to cover Shabbat UK, and I found myself giving interviews on radio and on television. And then one Shabbos morning, there was an editorial in the Times, whoever would have believed this was ever possible, an editorial in the Times calling on the Jewish community of the UK to keep Shabbos. <laughs> and the Times went further and called on every citizen in this country at least once every seven days to have a digital detox day. Because as the chief rabbi says, they said, our environment is trying to control us instead of the other way around. People out there realize that our age-old laws are so relevant, are so timely, 
timeless. And we're so privileged to have them because they have meaning, they have relevance, and they bring simcha, they bring true joy into our lives. And that's the point that Jacob wanted to make when he told us, larov, you should multiply like fish. And now I've come to commentary number five. So, I was studying in yeshiva, and I heard that there was a new concept about tshuva yeshiva, a yeshiva which existed not for people who wanted to become rabbis, people who wanted to do study Torah because that's what they just naturally wanted to do, but for irreligious Jews who were interested in maybe becoming more religious. It was called Or Samer. It had opened in an apartment in Jerusalem. It was the first Baal Tshuva Yeshiva. And I was intrigued to find out. And I went along to a lesson. I arrived late and I left early. I never found out who the rabbi was. But it took place in this week of the year. The Parash and the rabbi giving his commentary on Vigid Gularov, may you multiply like fish, said Jacob to his grandchildren and through them to Jews of all generations. So this rabbi, who I never know who he was, explained as follows. He said that sometimes it's difficult to determine if a fish is alive or dead, because both living and dead fish can be seen on the surface of water. But one thing is for certain. If you see a fish and it's flowing with the current, maybe it's alive or maybe it's dead. If you see a fish and it's swimming against the current, then for certain it is alive. And so too. If we go with the If we blend into our environment to the extent that we as Jewish people are swept with the current of our civilization around us, maybe our Yiddishkeit will be intact and maybe it will be lost. If, however, we find the capacity where appropriate to swim against the current, then we'll be able to guarantee that our Yiddishkeit will be alive. And I believe that one of our greatest challenges today is to determine where to draw that line, how to get the right balance, how to ensure that we do engage with the world, that we do embrace modernity, that we take advantage of the creativity of mankind in this sophisticated and exciting age, and at the same time, where appropriate, we stand up and we say we're Jewish, and we're different. There are certain things that we do in a different way, and we're proud of it. To what degree should we isolate ourselves or integrate into the world around us? To what degree should we show our differences or go with the flow? And I believe that in this regard, the greatest role model for us is Joseph, the most significant character in this week's portion of the law and these weeks at this time of the year. Joseph was a man who was brought up with the strongest possible education. He had none other than his father Jacob to He was imbued with spirituality. He was knowledgeable. And wherever he went, he took with him the image of his father and the passion that he had for the faith within which he was born. And it was Joseph, the biblical character, who entered into general society, non-Hebrew society, as we call it, Jewish society. He engaged with the world and he went right to the top of that world. He excelled. He was respected. He was able to determine when it was a to blend in with his environment and when it was necessary to show his difference. You know, when Moses sent the spies into the land of Canaan, he gave them a number of tasks. One of the tasks was, Find out, please, he said, if the Canaanite cities are walled cities or open cities. Find out if they live in fortresses or not. Now, our commentators differ on this point. 
Some of our commentators say that if the spies would come back and they would say to Moses, the Canaanites are living in fortresses in walled cities, that's a sign of their strength. There's no way the Israelites can overcome them. Other commentators say just the opposite. If the spies would come back and say the Canaanites are living in walled cities, that's a sign of their weakness because they're relying on the walls to protect them. We've got a chance against such people. And I think similarly, that's the dilemma for us today, to maintain our Jewish values. Should we or should we not build walls around us? And I am a strong advocate of living an open Jewish existence, of being a champion of Judaism which engages with the world, of having that Torahim Derech Eretz, that fusion of Torah study and Torah values blended in with modernity and worldliness. And without having those walls around us, we should have confidence in what we are about and the strength of our conviction to go out there, integrate within society, and to bring our values to ennoble and enhance society without the opposite happening. But there is a very important lesson that we need to remember. You see, Joseph succeeded as being that archetypal biblical character who engaged with the world and preserved his identity only because he started off with a solid education. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, just the two of them together, what reason did he give? He didn't say to her, I'm not in the mood. He said, If I did this, I would sin against God. And the Midrash tells him that at that moment, an image of his father came to him to remind him of his tradition, his spirituality, his real religious values, and he fled. So Joseph was able to swim against the current of his emotion and the influence of his environment because of the strength of conviction he was able to derive from the education he had received. And that is why I believe it is so critically important for us to invest in Jewish education. And some people err to believe that Jewish education is only for children. Is formal education, informal education, personal and communal for people of all ages. And that is why Limud provides such an incredible opportunity for all of us to grow and to develop. That is why I am here with you at Limud, in order to share Divrei Torah, to ensure that we have a stronger connection to our roots and our lives as Jews will be enhanced, and through what we do, we will be able to ennoble our environment. And with the education that we have, we will succeed, as Joseph did, without walls around him, to engage with the world, to succeed in the world, and to guarantee that he would always be loyal to his traditions. So there we have the five commentaries to those two words, v'yidgu larov. There we have in a nutshell the essence of the blessing that Jacob gave to his grandchildren and through them to us, and also the blessing that we give to our children and continue to do so through all ages. This sedra which speaks about brochas is all about in the first instance, ensuring that our families should be strong, healthy, domestic units through which we are blessed with shlombait, to ensure that, like Ephraim and Manasseh, we will be loyal within an alien environment to guarantee the strength of our traditions, and also to ensure that we can blend together Torah knowledge and worldliness. And taking a leaf from the book of Jacob, we should engage in Vayidgu Larov 
to ensure that we relate to every Jewish person with love, <coughs> with a and that everybody should be included, and as a result, we will have a strong, vibrant, and vital people. And also, that we should be proud of our Judaism, like Jonah before us. And if pride spreads, the result will be that we will be stronger within our tradition and our faith. And also, of course, to have enthusiasm, to counter the apathy that is so prevalent within our ranks today. Let's get the message out there. Yiddishkeit is fun. It induces happiness. It is relevant. It increases meaning in life. We're blessed to be part of the Jewish faith. And let us, like Joseph, find that capacity, where appropriate, to go with the flow, and where necessary, to differentiate ourselves from others and to swim against that current. But significantly of all, let us remember the first of our commentaries. It's the one of Rashi. We need help from heaven. With all the strategies in the world, with all our efforts, with a full sense of vision and everything that we try, we need God's help to survive as a people. This is the help that He has given us through the ages because He promised us that Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish nation, will live forever. And may He continue to give us this help. And may we continue to live in the spirit of the title of the Sidra, which is called Vayechi. He lived. Through all that we have learned, may we contribute to the ongoing life and success of the Jewish people in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, okay.